Hive is, and this came to be thought about in terms of primarily as a society, as a society with a distinct language, with a distinct culture, with a territory, with a government, with their own laws and regulations. And therefore, you know, they were like any other society. But then if you really want to look at the society, then why you call it tribe? But that means tribe is a particular type of society. And that particular type of society, again, began to be thought about either in terms of the technology. So one reason is, as I said, primitive. So that is what the type is. The other way to look at is the tribe primarily was being thought about in terms of a society which is based on what is known as a kinship organization, structure of kinship relationship. And also many thought of defining tribes in terms of the fact that they were the ones who didn't have the tradition of reading and writing. So there are different ways. But what I'm trying to say that unlike the colonial early 19th century or to uh, what's called early 20th century scholars who use the term primarily in terms of derogatory sense, you find little generation of anthropologists have used the term whereby they try to do away with this idea of, 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 of uh, primitiveness, etc., and try to understand them in terms of the typical structural features of the society. And the structural features of society, as I said, primarily are based on kinship, or you find the tradition, uh, lack of the tradition of reading and writing. So that's the way in which it began to be thought of. So basically a society, but a society which is a type, which is a different from the type of society where you find the division of labor, the gene equality, the, the hierarchy and so on and so forth. So it is against that kind of society, tribal society was being ca characterized because being a kinship based organization, it didn't have, it ha there was kind of homogeneity. There was uh, very little division of labor. And since there's very little division of labor, there was very little of social inequality and so on and so forth. So it was mostly you find it, you find it people, in fact, all, almost in a sense, resembled each other. So that is the sense in which it was being used. And compare that with a society which is more developed, where you find it primary division of labor, hierarchy, social inequality, social differentiation, engage in different kind of occupations and so on. So that's the way. So in India, this is a problem we have. And most of the groups whom we today call up tribes, they are no longer at the stage of the 19th century or the early 20th century. There has been enormous change. And therefore, anthropologically, one would say that, are we really in a position to call them tribes? So that can always uh, become a kind of problematic. But nevertheless, in South Asia, and particularly in India, despite this, and despite the fact that this term has not been used in other parts of the world, they use the term mostly indigenous people. Uh, we continue to use as, as, as they say, uh, the, the category of tribe. And that is largely because you find that in case of India, the category of tribe has become intricately connected with the constitutions, the legal and the administrative structure. So it is intertwined with the, 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 the constitutions, the legal framework and administrative structure. And I think it is very difficult to get out of the, this term, despite the fact that it has historically a kind of um, derogatory meaning and people abstain from using this term today. So what do you find that today, uh, in spite of all that, we continue to use, but in the in India, the use of the term, in fact, depends on who is really using, in what sense it is using. Mm -hmm. And uh, you find that there are a large chunk of people who will still think of tribes primarily in terms of being primitive. So that that is their perception, their way of thinking. But if you ask tribal people, including, let's say, from the Northeast or elsewhere, they wouldn't really define themselves in this category of being primitive or being a savage. They were primarily defined themselves in terms of a feature, which is uh, uh, this a feature of a society or feature of a community, which is strikingly very different from the kind of feature that the dominant society is characterized. In other words, they will primarily try to see that we are a society which are based on a principle which is contrary to the principles that marks the dominant society, namely the caste-based relationship. So it is in that context, by and large, people really use it. And uh, 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 so, so, so you find that the usage of the term today in India depends on who is really using it. There are, as I said, there are people who use with that 
derogatory connotations and often they will challenge in terms of the fact that how could you be tribe when you have really undergone change whereas uh, tribals you find that they will define themselves primarily in terms of referring themselves to belonging to a society which is strikingly very different from the rest of the society so there are lenses from which it is really looked at so i think i just wanted to uh, introduce this idea in terms of the fact that it is not a very homogeneous way of looking at the concept of tribe there is a different ways of looking at the concept of tribes and depends on who uses at what lens this uses and so on and so forth now coming to the northeast uh, you know the the northeast is a, is, is a is, a kind of a geographical category which really became a part of the colonial state administration the colonial administrative structure and uh, uh, subsequently you find that this idea of northeast has become a little become more consolidated uh, but then in the northeast when you are really talking about it is not mere geographical notion it is much more than that if you really talk of south india it is more of a geographical notion more, when you say north india it is more of a geographical notion in case of northeast india that it is yes a geographical notion but it is more than that and we have to find it out what is really that more than that what has really made it possible to uh, for the northeast to go beyond mere geographical category i think it is important because you find today that northeast had made a transition from just being a kind of a geographical notion a geographical territory to a kind of a administrative and political and administrative category so you find that northeast india when you talk about it is it emerges as a distinct political and administrative category and uh, one has to understand as to how this distinct political and administrative category that has really emerged is again that is an interesting story so today when you talk of northeast you have earlier it was a seven states uh, then in 2002 if i'm not mistaken sikkim was uh, added into it and therefore we have eight states which form part of the northeast now uh, uh, so if you really look at the northeast and sit with the tribal communities uh, i think you will find that they if you really look, look at in terms of the share of the tribals in the northeast let's say in, with reference to the total population total tribal population in india you find that they are around 12% and nearly 13% of the total tribal population in the country in fact resides in the northeast so it is a, a, a small number uh, because large chunk of tribals actually live in what is known as the central eastern and western india almost 75% that you really find that and 12% you find in 11% you find in south india 2% you find in the north india so that is the kind of an distributions you have now of this 12 or uh, 13% of the tribal population which resides in the north east if you really look at in terms of the geographical territory i think in the northeast probably they are one third of the total tribal population in the northeast so around 29 over 29 to 30% in fact forms the tribal population in the northeast that's the kind of a demographic that you really find but if you really break it in terms of the states that eight states that you have then what you really find that you have eight there are four states which predominantly are tribal dominated states and often many people describe them as a tribal states you have you have nagaland you have mizoram you have meghalaya and you have arunachal pradesh because tribals themselves govern the state and governs the other parts of the state uh, whereas other four states namely assam you have manipur you have tripura and you have sikkim where you find tribals really form a minority but this is a very substantive minority because if, if you really look at what the size of the tribals who form a minority in these states is almost to the tune of 30 plus so Ma manipur might be around 34 or so or 33 34 you have uh, tripura which again around 31 32 sikkim around 30 except for assam which is around 12% a little more than 12% so that is the kind of share that you find of the tribal population but then you find but the, the enormous diversity all so tribal groups does it i said one third of the total population but then if you really look at in terms of these groups you find that the enormous diversity probably 
on can can really count but uh, somewhere else have found that there are probably more than 200 different different com tribal communities in the northeast so that is the kind of diversity that you really find now coming to this uh, therefore the northeast despite this diversity how this idea of a uh, region you know has emerged and today you find that the uh, northeast it is it's uh, it's treated more as a region more as a homogeneous category and therefore this enormous diversity which is which which northeast yeah, northeast india actually marks uh, marks in fact to some extent get lost when you use the term the northeast because it becomes a kind of region it is the geography it is the political administrative reason which becomes more important rather than I to my mind at the people who actually con constitute an enormous diversity. Now the reason is that what really has made it possible because today if you really look at the northeast, the north the, as I said that it is has moved away from being a mere geographical notion to a distinct political and administrative category, and this began sometimes around the 90s, uh, what is called 1970s. So you have uh, institutions which is known uh, which is known as a Northeastern Council. The Northeastern Council is supposed to have been an advisory body for the whole of the Northeast. You find that there's a Northeast Development Financial Corporation in the uh, Northeast Development Financial Corporation, which is basically supposed to see a uh, financing the whole of the Northeast. You find there was Northeastern University, which was again supposed to cater to the whole of the Northeast. So what you really find that there were institutions which began to emerge, which was trying to look at the whole of the Northeast from a kind of a single framework of being a region. So these different kind of institutions have really come. And later on, you find that even the, the ministry, which has, there is a separate ministry for the Northeast, which is what's called Department of Northeast Affairs. So what you really find that this is, these institutions have come up and whole governance structure now is almost uh, goes through this kind of an institutions and, uh, 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 and so even if you do if you go beyond that you find that uh, let's say many of the central government institutions in fact they have their branches in the northeast which you may not necessarily find that it is there in other parts of India. So what has really happened is that since the 1971, the Northeast has begun to take shape as a very distinct political and administrative category. This kind of political and administrative category, you will find no parts of India. It is typical of the Northeast. Now, what has really given shape to this? And here, I think to my mind, probably the role and the place of the tribal communities of the Northeast India is very, very important. I think it is the kind of the politics, it is the kind of an articulations, it is the kind of kind of assertions which they began to make from the late 60s, from immediately after independence to the almost 70s and 80s. You find that that were the kind of social forces which were instrumental in shaping of Northeast as a region. That is how I really look at. So, so you find that uh, there were already immediately after independence, you have self-determination movement in Nagaland. You find that uh, Mizoram and Meghalaya were quite disturbed of the fact that what will really happen to them when they become part of an India. Uh, and, and, and and Meghalaya, in fact, uh, because there are 25, uh, what is called this, what is called the states that they had you know, uh, they were quashed into becoming a part of an India, which many people don't really know because it was, these were, they were small states, but they had, they had, they, they were outside, even during colonial period, they were outside of the colonial structure and they were forced to sign in uh, instrument of uh, uh, accession and then what is called, etc. So, which, and uh, 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 what's called agreement, which they had not really signed. So you find that there are certain kinds of coercions which was used in terms of bringing even Meghalaya, that particular 25 states into the Indian Union. So what do you really find that there were already this kind of an anxieties that was there. And uh, even in other parts of the, uh, even among other tribal communities, probably this may have been there, but it has not been adequately articulated. So this concern uh, which, uh, which, uh, which they had uh, of what will really happen to them once they become part of an India, what really happened to their identity, what will happen to their language, their culture, 
their traditions. And so this was something agitating. And Nagaland has already taken an extreme step in terms of being, in terms of seceding from India and therefore the armed struggles and so on and so forth. So keeping that in mind, you find that the, the national leadership, in fact, thought about working out a kind of political structure and institutional structure, which will try to safeguard them. And therefore, you find that within the constitution itself, you find that there, well, there, there is a, there is a uh, what is called provisions of what is known as six schedule, six schedule provisions, which therefore gives a sort of autonomous district council. So you find that Meghalaya, um, uh, Mizoram, and the, uh, the, let's say the hill districts of uh, Assam, the, the, at that time even Meghalaya and Mizoram were part of Assam. So the hill districts, which are part of Assam, in fact, they were given this space for what is known as the autonomous council, autonomous district council, within the purview of the six schedule provision, which basically means that it was a mini state. In the sense, they had executive power, they had legislative power, they had executive power, and they had judicial power. So within the larger state of Assam, you know, within their own particular districts where they were, where they formed a dominant population, they can constitute or there was a space within the constitution of constituting or Thomas district council. And therefore they had a kind of a power to make legislations, the executive functions and even judiciary functions. No, of course, not all the subjects, but on certain subjects which were already assigned, let's say in the schedule of the six schedule of the constitution. So, so that is what you find. So you in a sense the self-governance, a kind of institutional structure whereby they will be able to safeguard their interests. And if you look at what were the kind of subjects where they could make law, what were the kind of subjects on which they can take judicial, make judicial decisions, executive power, then you find that many of them, for example, land questions, the forest questions, the transport, the, the education, the health, the public sanitation, you know, the, the, the uh, traditional governing system, uh, the, 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 the traditional customary law, etc. So these were all came under the ambit of the autonomous district council. So this is what. So in in other words, you find that the whole questions of tribal communities and the concerns of safeguarding their identity, their language, their culture, to some extent, was addressed through this institutional arrangement. Now, this this did not. Uh, what is called, although this was there, uh, somewhere you find that it fell short of the aspirations of the people. And eventually you find that in the early 60s onward, the mid 60s onward, there was a movement for a separate state by the, the tribal communities from Assam. So, uh, and in 1971, you find there was a reorganization of the states and therefore new states really came out. Assam was divided into a number of states. And that is how you really find reconfigurations and therefore some of them become tribal states. And following that, you find that there have been more demands for cessation or more demands for the separate state. So particularly in Assam, in Tripura, because Tripura was not part of, uh, uh, didn't have the council. So what you will find that the 70s onward, there have been further movement uh, for the, state either within Indian Union or outside the Union. So Tripura tribes were raising these questions and eventually they were accommodated by giving them an autonomous council, if I'm not mistaken, in 1984. So uh, Tripura tribal areas autonomous council. So one council for all of the tribal communities who I understand are scattered over the four districts. Then, then later on you find that uh, there are borders in Assam which um, border territorial council and uh, the uh, board autonomous territorial council comprising almost of the four districts. So these were because you find in Tripura there was no constitutional safeguard. Even for the plain tribals of Assam, there was no constitutional safeguard either in the form of fifth schedule, which is there in the mainland India, and the sixth schedule, which was limited to the uh, what is called the hill districts. So you find that. The, the, when you find the reorganizations of the state and more autonomous structure was created for the hills, you find that the other tribals also began to make a demand and you find that is how it happened in Tripura and then it also took place in the context of an Assam. And uh, so these are, so you find in Northeast, you find that uh, these are 
these are the autonomous structure which comes under what is known six schedule of the indian constitution and six schedule as a state provides for legislative executive and judicial power therefore it is a sort of a mini state but then there were uh, uh, other states which did not have this and uh, manipur is one which is not a, although there is autonomous council but that is under state law similarly you find that assam later on in fact worked out autonomous council which is again a state law so if you look at the ravas you look at the tivas you have deori or you look at the missings you have missing autonomous council tiva autonomous council rava autonomous council and therefore they have been given certain kind but it is not really a kind of a state because that kind of legislative and judicial power etc so they basically do certain kinds of developmental activities that is the way so you find that this whole autonomous councils has become one of the ways in which tribal communities in the northeast india have been trying to i mean in the sense their concern for their identity and safeguarding and protecting their cause in fact to some extent has taken form or reflected in terms of this creating different kind of institutional structure whereby you know they have some space or participation in the decision making so this is what you will find and uh, uh, of course uh, in 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 in, um, in manipur there is always there is a six uh, hill areas autonomous council under the uh, start, state law of manipur but they have been demanding for the long time you know they they to come under the six schedule of the indian constitution so these are these are the issues with it but this autonomous councils you see uh, what you will find is that often it is really becoming a tribal based and uh, some to some extent you find that there has been this sort of a thinking that only way in which tribal communities in the region can safeguard the, the interest is by asking for this kind of different kind of institutional structure so this is really a, has gone deep into the psyche of the tribal communities in the northeast and i think every tribe is tries to make a claim for this and that and that is also i think there is a claim to make it because you find the autonomous councils itself have not really been too inclusive in that sense it's been little inclusive by and large you find that it tries to address the issues and the uh, what is called the problems of a dominant community and for example that these are the and that is come you have a north kachar hills autonomous council which was eventually named as dima hasau or you have karbi along with karbi so you find rather than the region it became more of a tribal oriented and therefore many tribal communities who live there in fact they felt that you know they are not really giving that kind of a say in the whole institution so this is the problem that has really come up in autonomous councils that there are other tribal communities who are there they feel left out and then they think that the only way in which they can articulate their interest is in terms of a demand for let's say a autonomous council so this this is one problem that has really come up and i don't know how to how the northeasterners are really going to negotiate with this kind of problem is something which really needs to be talked about so so you find that uh, that um, what 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 is saying that what even these autonomous councils there's a kind of an hegemonic structure which keep keep which which is which uh, seems to perpetuate itself uh, if you look at historically is bengalis which dominated and assamis were quite disturbed over it gradually you find an assam which took over but then they began to again dominate in the same way over the other tribal communities now once the other tribal communities have got the state of their own they seem to perpetuate again the same kind of domination over the other tribal communities and therefore others again make this kind of demand so you find that this hegemony and exclusion and therefore articulations and uh, what's called the, the assertions seems to be almost intricately connected with each other and therefore i think one has to really look at is there a possibility of thinking about the north east in some of alternative ways than the ways in which we have been thinking about the north east almost for the last let's say 50 or 60 years so this is one point that i was really wanted to refer to you the other issues is that uh tribal societies as i told you they are no longer what they were in the 19th century there are enormous uh, changes enormous uh, differentiation uh uh and that you can see they are no longer homogeneous in that sense of the term uh they have been, so in the process of the last uh, uh 
uh, hundred years or so, or particularly in the post-independent India, there has been a great transformation, and that transformation can be seen in terms of, as I said, educations, in terms of educations giving rise to a sort of a middle class, the articulations, the political articulations, creating kind of political structure. Uh, almost creating a sort of a nationalism, a demand for a separate state. These are all part of the transformations that tribal societies really went through, let's say, with the coming of, let's say, modern educations. So that, I think, is really is something which we look at. With the process, you find that uh, in the post-independent India, uh, you find that uh, most of the tribal communities, particularly those who have institutional structure, their own state, or even to limited extent where they have autonomous councils, I think they have been able to exercise some way in which they have given revitality to their language, uh, you know, have been able to safeguard their land, their territory, and other kinds of resources from encroachments, let's say from the outsiders and so on and so forth. So they have been really able to protect. Uh, at the same time, you find to some extent they have been able to develop themselves. So, 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 so these are the issues in the sense that um, the, com the coming of the institutions or the kind of articulations, you find that there has also been a development. This has also accompanied by various development indicators. And today, you find that in Northeast, if you look at in the social indicators, education is very high, it is higher than the national average, except you know, to some extent, uh, uh, maybe Arunachal is slightly less, but, but by and large, you find that the, the 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 level of education is, level of literacy is very high. And the, since there's a higher level of literacy, you also find that higher level of people really going for the higher educations. So you find that that's one of the good indicators that you can see. You also can find that the level of people living below poverty line is much smaller as compared to the rest of India, particularly as compared to the tribals in the other parts of India. So you find that even in terms, you don't find uh, what is called the same degree of people really living below poverty line. Is 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 they almost there may be various in the state. Maybe Assam will have a little higher level of poverty among the as compared to the Nagaland or Mizoram and so on and so forth. So these are the issues are there. So it has really paved the way. Health indicators again relatively better among the tribal communities. Now, so what you find today is that this development has also given rise to a kind of, of from, uh, issues which is which is marked by the fact that it is not homogeneous now. So when it when we initially we talked about tribal society, we always thought that they are homogeneous. They all do same kind of occupation. They say think in the same way. They have they are bound by uh, what is called same kind of traditions and so. So this is what we really, really find about. But that has undergone change. Today you find the northeasterners have is they have, seem to be or tribal society seem to be almost the same level as the other societies are. They become socially differentiated. They, are, they, they engage in different kinds of occupations. So they are a trade, they are a commerce, they are agriculture, maybe the shifting agriculture, you find uh, the, 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 the professional jobs, maybe politicians, uh, you know, the bureaucrats, the teachers, and so on. So, so what do you really find? That if you really look at the classes, or the Angamis or the Lusais, you find that that society is almost the same as the Asmi societies in terms of the nature and types of differentiation that you really find it. So, so, so this is this is the kind of resource that one really find. Now that is one. So really, you find that, but there is also a sort of differentiation in terms of religion. You find that. Uh, Tribal society in the northeast has also become heterogeneous. Earlier, they used to have animistic practices with the coming of the Christianity. Large number of people have embraced Christianity. But again, Christianity is not really homogeneous. There are so many sects. And you find that there is, uh, within the Christianity, you find that people really are adhering to different kinds of denominations and sects. But then you also find that there are people who still practice a traditional religion. And therefore, you find often there is a conflict among them. So you find that sometimes there is a conflict, a surface, let me not really come to the surface, but the underlying conflict between people who belong to different, uh, what's called different Christian denominations. But you also find that there's a conflict between the Christians 
and the non christians and this is you can find particularly in arunachal to some extent in meghalaya you can find maybe in 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 assam uh, you may find maybe to some extent in nagaland maybe in tripura and so on. so what you really find is that there is a new dimensions of cleavages and tensions that is really coming up which is primarily to do with the the the, the kind of uh, religious organizations for example Uh, if you take the Arunachal Pradesh, the the Doni Polo, which is basically kind of institutionalizing the traditional religion, and um, uh, uh, the coming of the Christianity, or rather the move, the what is called the 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 conversions of the many of the Arunachal tribes to Christianity. In fact, the seventies has led to a lot of tensions and violence. So you do find, therefore, these are the problems which are really simmering, uh, that is really emerging. the other the problem that one really sees is also in terms of um, inequality you know i think there is striking inequality that is visible in the north east today it is no longer homogeneous it is no longer in the sense egalitarianism and you find that there is a, there is enormous what is called the 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 the, the uh, uh, inequality and that in, inequality probably is more in terms of the income and income once you have more in style of life and therefore you find that um, the style of life of the people because of the income differences has also become very differentiated so inequality is something one really needs to confront today that is a part of it but despite this inequality or coming of the middle class or whatever you may talk about it or conceptualizing them as a middle class but nevertheless this inequality is more in the economic domain and to some extent you find in the pattern of consumption and pattern of the what is called the lifestyle but in terms of uh, what is called the, the social relationship you do not find the same kind uh, you, you, it is social it, in the social relationship it is this economic differentiation is not adequately reflected because i think the societies are primarily based on kinship and kinship is you know the kinship related is the is the blood relations or a final relation so you do find that the kinship relationship is there and because of this the economic inequality does not really get reflected let's say in the social and the cultural dimensions and to my mind so inequality is there but it is not really reflected in terms of discriminations or oppressions and exploitations which the inequality in other parts of india or inequality in other parts of the world has really taken so inequality invariably used to take the form of oppressions exploitations and discrimination that in the context of tribal communities i find that it is to some extent dormant it is not really visible at least i have not really uh, experienced this kind of um, things let's say even when you find a tribal society has become very inegalitarian and so on and so forth so these are some of the issues which really uh, is emerging and which probably when one has to really uh, take note of uh, So these are interesting features are there. Now, so what do you really find that uh, the in trying to understand tribal communities or societies in the North East, uh, you know, uh, probably these are issues which really needs to be addressed. In other words, you find that these questions of domination, subjugation, exclusion, and then again domination. Uh, what is called subjugation and exclusion this is something probably really needs to be looked at uh, needs to be looked at in other words what are the, what are the ways in which one can really think of building more inclusive society so for uh, for example because of the tribal societies because even the institute structure some of these issues are not really adequate that is i had already mentioned about it and one of the issues is of course gender questions gender questions remains a serious problematic as for the tribal issues tribal uh, uh, issues are concerned uh, identities so under the garb of an identity it is a little difficult to continue with the same kind of traditions where you find that as per the traditions the women don't have that kind of role uh, let's say in politics in the in public sphere you know and so on so forth and as a citizen or as an individual who is trying to grow or as enrich herself you find that there is also sign of aspirations and they will feel that as to how patriarchy in fact in a way trying to 
uh, are trying to come on the way of their development. And I think these these are issues are there. And often you find that traditional institutions, although they have been given or if, uh, what is called state institutions, or you find even the district autonomous council, etc., they have not really adequately addressed. And I think. Uh, these issues which are really coming up needs to be confronted and you find that although the the the, the mandate of the autonomous councils etc is more in terms of safeguarding and protecting but at the same time you find that as to how in safeguarding and protecting you also transform and see as to how you are really able to accommodate and how you are able to change the traditions in terms of bringing more people let's say, into participating or equal participation in the decision-making process. And therefore, you find that the institutions itself, uh, this can't really be imposed from an outside, and it's not good to impose from outside. But from within, I think the autonomous councils or states have to work out a kind of a mechanisms whereby you find that there is a greater and greater participation, let's say, for, 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 for people who have remained neglected or excluded from the participation in these institutions of the governance. I think this is what I th uh, uh, is something which you find pervasive in many of the tribal societies. And we all know what really happened in the, uh, uh, what is called municipal elections in Nagaland about, um, you know, women's participations. And, and since you find that there's a certain constitutional safeguard, let's say in terms of the fact that the parliament, what's called law enacted by the parliament or uh, cannot really be applied in the, let's say in in Nagaland or in Manipur, unless the state legislature really approves, unless it applies. But then when it does not really apply, therefore you then you find that it creates this kind of restriction, this kind of uh, what is called exclusion. And I think, uh, and we know more about it as to what really happened in terms of this municipal elections in Naga. These are the problems that really come to cleavages are there. So, so what I'm really trying to say is that for the long time, as for the tribal societies in the North is concerned, we have really taken tribes as a unit. We have tried to look at them as a category, as a distinct group. And then trying to examine, address, understand them. And in the process, we have talked more in terms of what actually uh, they go through vis-a-vis -vis the state or vis-a-vis -vis the other population. But I think that's also, that, that has undergone change. They have become more heterogeneous. There's more transformations. And I talked about it, various kinds of social differentiation. And therefore, I think uh, now there is a need to look at as to how we really look at the tribal society. So in the same situations, as in academics and students, probably we have to look at in a more from a different kind of lens. We can't just go on repeating the way in which tribal society has been studied in the 60s and 70s, because 60s and 70s tribal societies were very different than the kind of tribal societies which have emerged, let's say, in the last uh, today. And therefore, you have to think of the lens or perspectives which is going to be quite different than the kind of perspectives probably which we used, let's say, in the 50s and 60s. So this is these are the some of the issues probably which we really need to look at. So I think I just uh, tried, I, I just uh, tried to come to an end. So, so I will take the questions if you have. Uh, uh, Yeah, so these are some of the points which I wanted to, to highlight. Um, and um, I'll, if there are queries and questions, then I will take it and maybe try to clarify some of your ideas. So let me at this stage wind up my presentations and take for for discussions. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll be taking over to the question and answer session now. So um, if you have any questions regarding this, like uh, what sir discussed, you can post it in the chat. I think we already have few questions. Um, okay, so first one is from Ravi D. Bishnoi. Um, in what dimensions can we view the reasons for the reasons that the tribals of Northeast India have tended to incorporate modernity into the tribals? And what are the effects of attempts to annex tribes into the mainstream? What are not culturally positive committed? Uh, 
Yes, but in the sense that uh, when you look at the tribes um, and as to how they have become part of the wider world, the larger world, and even in the larger uh, larger world in terms of the values and ideology and so and and, and so on and so forth. So yes, I think uh, um, uh, modernity is something which. Uh, uh, which needs to be looked at more carefully because uh, modernity is much more than just being an westernized. Um, so I think uh, we really need to look at what exactly we mean by modern and what is really modernity and as to how that is reflected, let's say, among the tribal communities or people who belong to tribal communities, etc. So I think uh, those are issues are there, uh, probably there is a need to do much more work uh, in modernity. Sometimes you just look at the institutions, but I think modernity was also a side or is a sort of a style of our life in the, in the sense as to how we think, let's say, with respect to nature, how do we think with respect to others, how do we really respect it, how do we really look at in terms of our society, the culture, the, the the environment, the economy, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, that is what you constitute. And uh, as of, I know, there's not much of work, and therefore it becomes uh, very difficult to uh, give a straightforward answer that how do people really look at in terms as to how do we address, for example, inequality? How do they address the questions of liberty? How do they address the questions of equality? How do they address the questions of diversity and so on? These are issues which probably has not get crystallized in the Northeast because society is very diverse. But when we come uh, and, and if you look at the past, these are some of the problems which have come. But how do we really look at how do we really address this? This, I think, uh, I can't really answer. I'm not in a position to answer. But probably we need to have a little more research and writings on this. And I think that really will help. Now, as far as uh, importing the North is uh, the, the so-called mainstream, I'm always find this very problematic. In the sense that uh, why one really talks of incorporating north even today after almost 70 years of incorporating the north is into the main but first of all this whole idea of the mainstream is extremely problematic what is really mainstream which what is that what is that constitutes mainstream we talk about it but we are not really very sure as to what it really means have we really made it operational have we really spelt it out Similarly, if you look, talk about integrations, you know, sometimes people you talk about integ integrating in the mainstream. What is really means integration? I think you need to problematize it. What does it mean? Or are we really under the gerb of incorporating or integrating? Are we not really referring to assimilating them? Now, so I think th these are concepts are there and we have to fine-tuning this concept. What do we mean by integration? What do we mean by it? incorporation is probably more harmless term, the same that you incorporate into the larger. Uh, but when you talk of integration, again, you have to spell it out. What does it really mean? Are we really meaning that when you use the term integration, primary and assimilation? So assimilation is a very different term than integration. To my mind, if you really look at the Northeast, Northeast got incorporated into the larger system during the colonial rule, they became part of the colonial rule, a colonial state structure. So they were incorporated into it. Yes, there were, uh, uh, within that uh, incorporation, there were certain kinds of exclusion, certain kinds of social arrangement, whereby they are being protected. Because if you allow a free movement of the people, you allow a movement of the market, probably you find that Northeast would have been in the same kind of situations as the tribal communities in mainland India because you find that tribals in the, uh, in the mainland India, others, in fact, went on moving into the tribal areas and you opened it to market, trade, commerce, you know, the, 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 and then it gave it to land market, to commodity market, credit market, and the land began to move from the tribals to the tribal. No, I think, uh, despite the, so that can, there was this idea of protecting them, safeguarding them, because if it is opened it up, it's going to have a devastating consequence to the community. Many people, in fact, have a policy that the British used the divide and rule. They were, you know, they, 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 they kept them separate, etc. But 
if you look at today and try to understand what out uh, what what implications it have I sometimes i value that this kind of safeguard which was made during colonial period thereby through inner land permit or uh, uh, you know the, through restrictions etc in fact help them to safeguard themselves and now that they have become educated they become conscious they have become developed they have become uh, assertive you know that is when th they can negotiate it i think so it has really been to my mind i always look at in positive sense rather than in the negative sense whereas because i know it what really happened this kind of integration what really happened in mainland india the mainland india was integrated in the larger part during colonial period and what it did it just did alienation of land people moving into it taking away their land by fraud by forgery and so on and so forth these have been the kind of the feature so in that sense i find that so incorporated yes but within that incorporation there were a kind of safeguard in terms of excluded areas or in terms of what is called these excluded or uh, what is called parcel excluded area these were ways in which they were trying to address and these were basically also in the frontier regions now so that is there but then integration secret i think no this has become integrated so why you want to raise it again and again they are part of the larger political system they are part of the constitutions they have elections have been going on they are you know the 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 the, the, the going through the institutional structure is there so what more do we need so what do we mean by an integration so once you find that they have become part of the system, they are part of the process, they're part of the administrative structure, and all kinds of political, economic, and social process, they are integrated in terms of economy. They are integrated to some extent in terms of market. So there is a market integrations. There is a, what is called administrative integrations. There's a political integration. Then why do we keep on talking about that they need to be integrated. My idea is that when you are talking about, you talk more in terms of assimilation. So, can we? You mean to say that they should be integrated emotionally? Because politically they are integrated, economically integrated, almost probably socially, so socially and culturally probably they are not. But then, do you really want to say that socially and culturally they must be integrated? What does it really mean? Basically, means that when you talk of cultural and social integration, so you are basically talking in terms of assimilating them into the more dominant kind of society, which is problematic. So I think that is the way in which, uh, to my mind, uh, one really has to look at. So integrations, incorporation is already there and it has been there for so long. There's no problem about it. But if you still think of integration, then I think you have an entirely different notion of integrations. And I think you would have to spell out what is that. And to my mind, this they really talk when people talk about it. I think they more talk in terms of emotional integration that people in the North East must be emotionally integrated. Emotional integrations will come only when you share. Uh, they think that uh, like emotional integrations when you are becoming a part of the culture of the larger Indian society, which is always uh, problematic. So, uh, uh, the, 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 in other words, rather than talking of an assimilation, I think we are talking of integrations where we have said that we are part of the larger structure economically, politically, and you know, despite that, we want to maintain our distinctiveness in terms of our language, our culture, our identity. That I think is a fine. That's what the integration talks about. So basically what you call unity, diversity and unity, in fact, are intertwined with each other. And that's what I think is an important. Um, there are two more questions, sir, if you are OK with taking them. No, no problem. Uh, so, okay, the next question is again from uh, Ravi De Vishnoi. Uh, he asked, uh, um, the customs and cultural features are distinctive of the tribes. Don't you think that it is here today that features are generating uh, geographical regionalism or hyperactivity over the region for Northeast India? Yeah, that, that's, I think I have already referred to. You see, there is a, a difference. And I think... Uh, the difference sometimes is because of the process, economic and political, which is again more of a dominating and or you find that some have got advantage of it given the economic and political structure and some have not really got that advantage. In other words, there is a kind of deprivation, feeling of a sense of deprivation. So that does lead in a way in terms of articulations. Uh, an assertions 
which somewhat challenges the kind of hegemony that really exists. This is what I was really, really trying to say that. So these, these problems are there. I think more smaller groups, uh, groups which seem they have not really got what others have got it. And they do feel deprived, they do feel excluded. They do feel a sense of discriminations. And then oh, there is a rage, raging of issues. So even those who have developed, always there's a comparison. So you compare with others and you find that some states probably or some groups have got more or have been more privileged as compared to others. And therefore, this deprivation, sense of deprivation remains. And I think this is uh, this is one which has led to various kinds of retention. So that, that remains. For example, the whole idea of when the hill tribes were you know, given all kinds of opportunities and plain tribals did not. Now that really gave, gave the sense of deprivation that we also are tribal communities, but we do not have really those facilities. Uh, we do not have those institutional structure. For example, if you take the boroughs, and that is where it really turned out. Or you take the tribals from the Tripura, you know, they didn't have all this. The Naga uh, was called particularly the, the in Manipur, they still feel deprived because the other states have the autonomous council under the six schedule, but they have under the state council. So there is a level of deprivations in there, and this level of deprivations did lead to a kind of an articulation, sometimes even leads to tensions as well. So, yes, because of the language and other things are there. So I'm not saying that everything is fine with Northeast. There is a problem, and you know, ethnicity, language, culture, maintaining the boundaries, these are a problem. But within the larger framework as to how we are really able to keep that, that is, that's again, thing I think is interesting. Northeast to my mind is very peculiar in the sense that we have a sort of common sense, a common destiny of being a Northeasterness. That I think is a fantastic. But then that common identity, common sense, cooperation is there. But in terms of being a different, now being a different, without uh, being a different, that is, I think, is an interesting and whether this can, but then when you are being a different, that common identity which you have, that, that is where you find sometimes there's a fracture. That's that way where you find some people feel not really adequately included or, you know, uh, 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 or given the rightful place into it. That is where you find that these problems are really coming up. For example, if you ask the, the Muslims in the Northeast, they may have been there for many years, or you find the tea garden workers in the Northeast. They do feel that, you know, we have been here for generations and we don't really get. So these are, these are factors which are really going to come. And often we, do, we, we tend to ignore this kind of dimension. So what I find is that there is a common sense of identity that has emerged. But then that identity, probably it is more of a political and administration. A political and administrative, it hasn't really moved into a kind of social and cultural levels. So socially and culturally, we don't share with each other. We are more different. We are more segmental features. And therefore, whether we should really talk in terms of even socially and culturally being a part or integrated with each other, which is a problematic because it's precisely this we have tried to challenge and try to work out our own. So Northeast will remain, this kind of political structure, this political feature is remain. I think the, 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 at the cultural level and the social level, you find that different communities will try to maintain that kind of boundary. But at the same time, maintaining the boundary, yes, there will be, a, to my mind, a sort of common sense of belonging to the region. And that probably you find in Delhi, you have been able to organize, but you won't find this kind of things in the Northeast, except by the universities or by some student associations it, it, or by civil society organization. But people as a whole, they wouldn't really move into that. So we do feel uh, Northeastness when we are out. But when we are in the Northeast, I don't think we very strongly identify ourselves as a Northeastness. We identify more ourselves as belonging to Naga or belonging to Mizo or Khasi, etc. And within that you have. So this is a paradox. This is a this is a social reality, probably which needs a much more thinking and reflecting and maybe theorizing. I am not in a position to do that. Thank you. So, okay, so this is the last question. Uh, is by Rajiv Sahu. Uh, sir, in a deep diversity, how can the government deal 
with the needs of the tribals of northeast india so that no other separatist activities will take place in future this, <laughs> this is a question which is very difficult to answer but see i think in northeast we all appreciate diversity and uh, and I, I think it should really be appreciated. I really value this diversity, which is really a very marked feature of the Northeast. And um, I think each one is trying to safeguard their diversity and distinctiveness. And that's what really what what is have really happening in the Northeast. But one may say, but then I think if we really uh, be a part of the Northeast, uh, along with this diversity, but then the diversity must also be addressed in terms of equal opportunity, in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, equality in terms of access to education, access to resources, access to income, and so on and so forth. The disparity is becoming more stronger and stronger in the Northeast. And I think that is creating more and more problems. So sometimes disparity also is moving around ethnic lines. There are some tribal communities who are economically less advanced, uh, uh, highly disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis the others. Within the advanced society, there is a inequality that we're talking about. So what is really happening in the North is inequality and unevenness of access to the what we value as something we should have. That is, I think, to my mind, creating more problem than the, the and, and I think language and culture is getting reinforced because of this disparity that is there in terms of, as I said, uh, unequal access and in terms of the kind of inequality that is really coming up. That, I to, that is how I really look at the Northeast. Um, I did not uh, scroll down. So there are two more questions. Um, one is from uh, Nina Thakur. Uh, it says, uh, sir, the tribals are hugely changing due to influence of modern society. What would you suggest to save their ethnicity? I, th I think he has already answered this particular question before that. I think they are all self-guarding their ethnicity. There's no problem with ethnicity. <laughs> true, okay, sir. So true. I think, uh, so, okay, there is another question by Vishwajit Pandya. Uh, question not directly about Northeast, but you have raised issues of conceptualizing and questioning some assumptions. What would be your take on PVTG? Earlier it was PTG. Oh, well, uh, uh, PVTG, yes. Uh, in the Northeast, there are very few of them. I think uh, there's a tribe in uh, Tripura which is considered to be PVTG. And, uh, but PVTG is more a feature of the uh, peninsular India and South India and all that. There's the tribal communities which are considered to be Earlier, they were known as a primitive tribal group, but then later on, the whole connotations have been changed and they're particularly vulnerable tribal group. And um, so there are, I think in 75, they were identified 75 of them. Uh, yes, uh, they were largely groups which were uh, sort of uh, lived on um, or where a stage of pre-agriculture, in the same hunting and food gathering and shifting agriculture, these were some of the features. That is an issue which one really needs to look at as to how we are really going to address PBTG. Uh, you know, these are very small group of people, tribals with maybe 500 or maybe 1,000 or maybe 2,000. These are small groups and with their uh, with them uh, losing ground, we are really going to lose enormous diversity in terms of language and um, traditional knowledge and other kind of things. So yes, I think we have to really look at, and government has embarked on uh, planning and development for them since the since the, since the uh, 1975, I think, 55 year plan with this tribal sub plan and all that. There's a separate approach for them. But I'm not really sure as to why it has it not really working. Because uh, despite almost 40, 50 years of a special approach to them, uh, and they being a very small in number, how is it that we are not really able to improve the quality of life of these smaller groups of tribal communities, which are primarily, as I said, in the peninsular India? Uh, 
so that that remains and um, uh, i thought that the scheduled tribe and other forest dwellers act probably will will really help them a lot because of <laughs> the 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 uh, right to habitations and right to customary way of living etc i think uh, that is what is important and therefore to my mind if you really want to address very seriously about the pvtg i do believe that the forest rights act and particularly the rights of habitations and rights of the customary rights of a forest of the pvtgs that to my mind is very very important because i think uh, uh, we have really tried to make them do things uh, uh, in much a short span of time which probably they were not really have witted to it I mean, this is basically trying to modernize them by force and i think uh, or integrate them by force in terms of introducing all kinds of foods and other kinds of things which was not really in tune with their health with the tune with the physiology which they have developed in course of maybe 100 years or 200 or 300 years so i think that has really led to my mind kind of depletions of the populations their health problems various other kinds of problems has come up this is a serious problem which i think the india needs to really address uh, particularly the questions of pvtg north easterners may not be aware of this whole idea of pvtg because i think except as i said except for one tribe in tripura maybe and there is one or two you know we don't really identify that kind of a group but this is a phenomena which really needs to be, and i have i just said i have no answer to it and i, I feel deeply disturbed over the resource because many of their population many of these groups are actually losing their population their declining populations and if this process really goes on probably you will find that they will disappear as well so that's the anxiety and tensions which we as all thinking persons should really go through should have sir uh, i would like to um, ask a particular question it's although it's not related to what been discussed today it's just my curiosity because uh, you have been dealing with northeast and uh, the tribe obviously so i just want to know about subaltern management or any uh, such kind of uh, subaltern um, business uh, groups where you have been acquainted with or you have the you know um, privilege to talk to them and you know uh, understand their way of doing business since i am from commerce department so i would like to know about that no well i think you are the best person being in the north is because i think uh, uh, if you really look at the 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 hill tribes or also you know many plain tribals in fact they have entered into commerce and business so how do they really how they are surviving how they are really have moved into it and how they are able to uh, continue despite other kinds of competitions i think uh, Uh, th these are important. We, yes, in the case of uh, we have Dalits, you have Dalit Chamber of Commerce. Right, right. So that is the Dalit Chamber of Commerce, and as to how Dalits have tried to become entrepreneurs, and yet when they move and try to go, you know, uh, it when they are participating in entrepreneurship, they have been saying that they are experiencing whole layers of discriminations. Mm -hmm. So you know, the entrepreneurship uh, subaltern groups. venture into it it is not something again a very smooth process you find that the process of discriminations and uh, and and um, uh, what is called uh, what is called lack of cooperation society it remains there are market problems are there market potentialities you know they are not able to master that kind of market but all market itself is not free because you find of discriminations so all these layers are there so i think if one is venturing into a business led by the led by the by tribal communities uh, probably the 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 experiences will be the same as that of the 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 the, the dalits that they have been experiencing uh, so long as they are particularly if they move beyond their territory in the same move beyond their community and they experience kind of competitions then i think there's a problem because i have heard a lot of them there are many cooperatives which were formed and as to how those cooperatives actually failed because of the way in which uh, people who were engaged in trade and commerce ensured that this really fails because right. they didn't allow them to make, compete in the market they didn't want them to come into the market and you know uh, what is called uh, do trade and commerce which are really going to uh, uh, harm them so these were uh, these are problems out there so within their own state probably they have been doing very well uh, 
there's a uh, one is stock keeping and trading is one thing but then business and developing that business and how they do it these are reasons i think north is a good example because the kind of people who are entered into trade and commerce in the north is you won't find in mainland india right so right it is not there you go among you go to rachi or you go to raipur and try to find out uh, 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 tribal people who have been engaged in the business and you will find that you will be surprised that you won't be able to find one which is not the case in the north is you will be able to if you go to dibrugarh or you go to tezpur you will do find at least the sum right or if, you go, if you go to nagaland you will find even more or meghalaya you will go even more you have showrooms of these and that it's all done by the, the tribal people of mizoram so, so when they are among them then i think they are fairly able to get uh, what you call sustain but when they move into an area where there's a competitions coming from the outside i think it becomes very difficult for them yes sir so actually i'm from a very small um, uh, hamlet and uh, it's in northeast assam and also we uh, mostly the people there is missing tribe Mm. so they don't get acquainted with any kind of those kind of businesses because people normally think they are more into the untouchable or you know yeah. more unprivileged section so yeah, they yeah, normally yeah. don't purchase from there so they those things are still privileged yeah. sir no, that is there <laughs> yeah that is there and up to you see is not only problem from an outside but also how skilled you are sometimes we right. are not even skilled also there so in business i think problem comes from both our inadequacy as being in tribe at the same time when you are dealing with you face stiff competitions from the outsiders so that really makes them that makes the problem even more difficult right sir right thank you so much thank you so much for your time it was indeed a great experience for even me and for entire team and of course the audience too i'll get back to avilash yes you can carry forward uh, thank you sir thank you ma'am now i request sandeep to deliver the word of thanks please sandeep um a very good evening to everyone um, it is my privilege to have been asked to uh, propose a vote of thanks on this occasion i uh, on behalf of the northeast and hansraj college want to extend my deepest gratitude to professor kaka for his insights and efforts towards um, making us understand the discourse regarding tribal culture identity and politics um i think this is a helpful topic not only for us as indians but for us in northeast cells across the universities and by extension the entire northeast region um is a very important one i would also uh, like to mention our deep sense of appreciation for our convener northeast cell dr beauty das ma'am i would also like to express my sincere thanks to all the participants for joining us in this lecture today and uh, finally i would like to acknowledge the efforts of my fellow executives of northeast cell without whose efforts this would not have been successful thank you Very good. thank you everyone thank you. Okay. thank you god bless you sir everyone okay. god bless. thank you thank you.
hello. Uh, we have shared the link for the Google feedback form. So please fill up the form to receive your participation certificates. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Um, everyone, uh, you can leave now. Thank you. Thank you. 